In this video, we're going to discuss banking. Banks and money evolved together. In fact, banks were started to solve problems that existed with early money. Early money consisted of metals and coins, and these were very heavy and difficult to carry. There was also a risk of carrying all of your money at one time. You could be robbed or you could lose uh, it. And lastly, idle money earned no interest. So banks stepped in and they specialized and they provided payment and transfer services for individuals. So you could leave your metals, your coins, your money at the bank. And if you wanted to buy something uh, or, or sell something, you would do it through the bank and the bank would handle um, the transfer. Uh, of payments that you make or payments that were to you. And then lastly, any idle money the banks could loan out, they could make a profit by doing that on your behalf, and they could share with you uh, the return, the interest that they would, uh, they would earn by loaning it out. So banks did many things. Now, if we look at the basic value proposition of a bank, it's to provide financial intermediation. They accept deposits and they make loans. So banks mediate between savers and borrowers, between the long-term needs and short-term needs. Now, you could loan money without a bank, but it's much easier uh, to, to, to borrow and loan money um, through a bank. It's, it's, it's easier for the borrowers. It's easier for, um, it's easier for, the, for the lenders. Now, to make a profit, the banks charge a higher interest rate for the loans than they pay on deposits. And you can see the flow from the, from the left here. The saver deposits $100. $90 gets loaned out to the borrower who pays 6% interest, uh, which is equal to $5.40 in, uh, in a given period of time. The bank would keep $1.40 and pay interest to the saver, the original person whose money it is who's actually loaned out $4. So this is kind of a, a win, win, win. The the saver gets to earn money on, on, uh, on their idle deposits. The borrower gets access to funds that they wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, and, and the bank makes, makes a profit. And this is the basic business model for banks. Um, now, uh, what you know, banks create many benefits. There's many benefits to having banks or depository institutions, which is a more broad name, name for a bank. First, they bring borrowers and savers together more easily than the borrowers and savers could, uh, could, could on, their, on their own. Second, it lowers the risk of lending through pooling. So the bank might make 100 loans or 1,000 loans. And so maybe a few will go bad, but, the, uh, um, uh, uh, but most of them will not. Whereas if an individual might make only one or two loans, and that's quite risky. So there's no uh, uh, pooling helps you lower the risk which is definitely something you, you, you'd want to do in the situation. And then last, because of all this, it lowers the costs of lending, of borrowing, and, and of monitoring um, um, the uh, uh, loans and the performance of loans and, and the risks of loans. So banks provide all these um, beneficiary functions. But banks have to balance profit and liquidity, they want to loan money out because that's how they make profits and make money on behalf of their depositors. Uh, but they have to also be able to uh, return the money to depositors when they want it. So they can't loan out all the money. They have to keep some of it on hand and only loan out the, the, the money that's, 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 that's truly idle. And they also, when they make loans, have to make sure that they are loaning the money to people who will pay it back. It doesn't do any good to make the loans if... The, uh, the, 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 the borrowers don't pay the money back. So they have to, they have to make sure they do all of those, these things. And so this is what the bank specializes in, in, in managing this. So there's a number of types of banks and depository institutions. And banks is, you know, there, there, are, there are some depository institutions that are not banks. You can deposit your money for various reasons in places that are not banks. And we call these, we call these non-bank financial institutions. Uh, so commercial banks are private firms that receive deposits and make loans and they're owned by stockholders. They're in the business to, uh, uh, to, to make money doing that. And they offer a full range of banking services. And these are some of the big names of banking that we know, like Chase Bank and 
Citibank and Bank of America and uh, banks like that. There are also something called thrift institutions, which are nonprofit savings and loan associations. They do most of the stuff that banks do, but they do it on behalf of their members. They're, 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 not, they're nonprofits. They offer a, a wide range of bank services at, at, at lower costs. They might not do all the things that the bigger banks could do. Uh, but for, but for, for, you know, for most of the basic uh, depositing and earning interest and making loans and, and, and borrowing money, they, they, they do that as well. There are also money market mutual funds. Money market mutual funds are, these are products that are, these are offered by institutions and they, they basically you, instead of depositing your money into a checking or savings account, you deposit into a money market account and they'll use that money to buy United States treasury bills. This is, uh, treasury bills are securities that come in different denominations, which are, which are essentially uh, loans to the United States government. When the U.S. government borrows money, they issue United States treasury bills and you can buy them directly from the government. But most people, if you want to buy them, will buy them through mutual funds that specialize in, in, in buying and selling uh, treasury bills. And so these are um, actively traded and generally considered uh, a, a low risk. Now, there are other types of banks um, which the general public really doesn't deal with so much that are really oriented more towards business, like investment banks, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. These are private banks that try to earn a profit, but they they take um, deposits and they make investments directly in businesses, in corporations. It may be in the form of a loan sometimes, or it may be in the form of a of 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 the of um, uh, of the purchase of, of, of equity. And so they make money if the value of these companies increases and if they don't, then, then they lose money. So these are generally considered riskier ventures because you're investing in, um, you know, the ups and downs of various businesses and sometimes they're up and sometimes they're down. Um, and, but, but this is, this is not, this is really more for done for investment as opposed to, um, to traditional types of, 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 of saving. Of course, we have stock investment funds like um, T. Rowe Price and Fidelity and, and Vanguard. These are, um, these are funds that take in deposits, but they invest them specifically into widely diversified um, portfolios uh, of, of investments into businesses and corporations. Um, and so deposits, in, in this case, you make money if the value of the things that the stock investment fund invested in went up. And if the value of those companies or stocks go down, then, then you lose money. So again, this is more risky than investing in government securities or treasury bills or certainly just depositing uh, your money in the bank. And then probably the most risky and, and the last is hedge funds, which are private firms that are for-profit firms. They take in... Uh, money from you call them depositors, but they're they're really clients, and they make uh, investments in a wide range of, um, of of endeavors, and some of them are more risky endeavors. So, stock investment funds, there's a limit to the amount and type of risks that they're allowed to take. Uh, this is not true with hedge funds. So, you know, the fundamental principle of finance is the trade-off between risk and reward. So people who are looking to put money at play for in, in hopefully of the highest reward um, by taking the highest amount of risk, that's uh, what that's what uh, hedge funds do. Now, it's important to note uh, when you deposit at a savings and loan or you deposit at a commercial bank, you make a, a t the, those funds are insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Uh, Money that you give to an investment bank or a stock investment fund or a hedge fund are not insured. If you lose money because the value of those investments goes down, that's on you. And, and, and that's, there's, there's no uh, insurance or somebody who's going to um, um, make up for your losses in those cases. So that's kind of the range of institutions that are in, um, in the banking and, 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 uh, and depository institution uh, industry. So all banks really have to 
put their deposits into a number of categories. Reserves, which is stuff that they um, hold, um, stuff that they don't loan out or put to work in an effort to, to make a profit. They have some liquid assets, which are treasury bills and commercial bills, short-term notes that they can um, um, earn some return on, but uh, they're also quite liquid and, and and not very risky, so they can get that money uh, quickly if, if they need to. Uh, they'll make some investments in, in securities and, you know, um, Traditional banks, commercial banks, and savings and loans are not really allowed to invest in securities. Um, they are allowed to invest in uh, government bonds uh, or, or uh, things like that, but they can't invest in the stocks of Amazon and Apple and, and Google or any other company for that matter. So if you want, if you want your deposits to be invested in stocks um, like Amazon, Apple, and Google and the and, and uh, then, then you invest in a mutual fund or a hedge fund. If you want your money to be um, invested with uh, borrowers um, or in, um, uh, you know, less risky things that are insured, then you invest your money in commercial banks or in savings and loans. So all the, dep so the, the depository institutions will, break up their uh, deposits and they'll keep some in reserves. They might put some in liquid assets and securities like government bonds, but their main purpose is to loan money out. They loan out as much as they can do safely um, after they've provided for reserves. And um, because that's the way they make money, that's the way they make profits. So depository institutions, banks are in the business of making loans. You can see here, this is commercial banks, which are uh, the major banks that we have in, in the United States. And you can get an idea that they've, and this is a balance sheet of, a, um, the, of, of commercial banks, uh, sources and uses of funds. So most of their funds come from deposits and most of their uses of funds goes into loans. So they might have some liquid assets or maybe here they have a fair amount of securities. Um, these are really more of a holding pattern. So these are things that they don't want to put into reserves because reserves are nothing, and they're not in a position to loan out at this point. Maybe they don't have enough uh, creditworthy borrowers, and so this money is being set aside until they find creditworthy borrowers. Uh, maybe this is, um, uh, you know, there's lots of reasons, but you can think of the liquid assets and other securities really as a holding. A pattern that earns some interest, but their main focus, the main use of funds in a bank is to loan money and to earn interest. Now, depository institutions, as we mentioned before, are engaged in the practice of risk. It's part of their business, regardless of whether you are you know, making loans or investing in securities. There's, there's risk to all those endeavors. Some are more risky than, than, than others. Um, but there's risk uh, with all of them. Now, they, banks keep reserves as a way of, um, of dealing with the risk. So some of the money they don't lend out at all, and it's kept in, 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 um, in, in, in case um, they have uh, a loan that fails or an investment that fails. Well, the reserves are used to, to cover that so um, they, can, they, can, they can carry on uh, with their business. Now, if personal accounts up to $250,000 in a bank, in a commercial bank or a thrift institution are insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So if you have a deposit in um, M&T Bank for $100,000 and the bank fails, well, you, you're, you're not out the $100,000 because that money is insured with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It may take a little time, but you would get back the $100,000 from the insurance, and so you wouldn't be out. So in this sense, there's very little risk in um, having your money in a bank account, in a commercial bank account, uh, or in a thrift institution. This is not true with um, uh, uh, um with investment banks, money that you give to an investment bank or to a mutual fund, an investment mutual fund, 
like T. Rowe Price or to a hedge fund. That money is not insured. If the money is lost, then you lost it and it's gone. And uh, that's the end of the story. So let's talk about the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank is the central bank of the United States. The central bank is a public authority that regulates the nation's banking system and all the banks that are in the banking system. It also uh, controls the amount of money that's in the economy. The Federal Reserve Bank of the United States was created by an act of Congress in 1913. So it's a little over uh, 100 years old. Now, it isn't just the United States as a central bank. Really, every country that has a currency has a central bank. And so the uh, Federal Reserve System does a number of things on behalf of our banking system. Well, it regulates and monitors private banks and deposit institutions to make sure they're complying with the banking laws and regulations. If you're required by the law to maintain 10% reserves and the Federal Reserve Bank is the one that monitors and makes sure that you're complying with that law. And as a matter of fact, holding 10% uh, in reserves. So the Federal Reserve Bank monitors and regulates our banking system and the member banks. The Federal Reserve is the lender of last resort. So let's say an individual bank somewhere fails. Well, the F Fed is the one that kind of steps in and tries to help the bank. Maybe they're just short on reserves and with a small loan for a short period of time, they would be, they would be solvent, be able to stay in the business. The Federal Reserve will give them that loan. Maybe they're not, the problem is bigger than that. They might negotiate and have another bank purchase them. Maybe provide the financing as a way of keeping um, the, 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 um, the bank afloat. But the Fed, Federal Reserve stays in this, this is the lender of last resort. They're the ones the, that, um, that kind of back up the, the, the system overall. Now, the federal funds rate is the interest rate that banks use to borrow and lend reserves from one bank to another on an overnight basis. So I'm a bank and I close at six o'clock and I got more reserves than I need. I might loan them to a um, to another bank overnight. With the idea they'll repay me in the morning. And the federal funds rate is the rate at which two banks will conduct that transaction. The Federal Reserve Bank sets the target rate, the target federal funds rate, and they do it eight times a year based on prevailing economic conditions. So when two banks might loan each other money overnight, um, they would they, they would use the federal funds rate that the Federal Reserve Bank sets as a guide, uh, and and use that as the as the rate they charge each other when 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 they're doing this. Now, maybe the most important thing the Federal Reserve Bank does is it implements the nation's monetary policy. Their goal is to keep inflation in check. They also want to maintain full employment and they want to moderate the ups and downs of business cycles. And uh, if they're able to do that, then hopefully they'd be able to, con to contribute to the economy achieving its, its, um, its long-term growth. So the Fed uses monetary policy to achieve all these macroeconomic objectives. If you'll notice, they're the same macroeconomic objectives that Congress uses to conduct fiscal policy, to maintain full employment, to moderate business cycles, and to um, keep inflation in check. So the Fed has a very particular structure. There's really uh, three parts to the Fed. There's a board of governors. There are regional Federal Reserve Banks, and then there's an open market committee, which is the one, which is, which is where the monetary policy happens. So the Board of Governors is, is, a, is a seven members appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. They serve 14 year terms, and every so often old ones drop off and new ones come on. And the President appoints one member to be the chair uh, person. 
Uh, it's currently uh, Chairman Jerome Powell is the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Um, prior to that, it was Chairwoman Janet Yellen and and and, and other folks. So um, normally the chair of the Federal Reserve will be there for a long time, five years, 10 years, um, maybe more. And um, the chair of the Federal Reserve is the head of the, the Board of Governors. There are 12 regional Federal Reserve banks and each there's, there's you can see the different regions um, he, here on the uh, on the chart. Uh, each one of the regional banks has a nine person board and a president. So there's a president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, a president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the banks that are within the jurisdiction of each one of these regional banks are overseen by the regional banks. That's the main role that the regional banks play is to oversee the banks that are in their uh, geography or jurisdiction. And then lastly, there is the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC. And this is the main policy making group of the Federal Reserve Bank. These are the one, this, this is the group that conducts monetary policy. It consists of the Board of Governors, always the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and 11 presidents of the other regional banks, but only four of them are voting members at one time. And so the, uh, the group meets every six weeks to formulate monetary policy. In practice, the Fed chairman has the largest influence on Fed policy. It's a very powerful position. They control the agenda of the board. They direct the Fed staff. They're the spokesperson for the Federal Reserve Bank and the point of contact with the federal government and with other uh, central banks around the world. And you can see here the current uh, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman is Jerome Powell. The previous um, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman, uh, Chair People is Janet Yellen, Ben Bernanke, and Ellen Greenspan. Now, the federal, the chairperson of the Federal Reserve Bank is so powerful. Um, they really, they're the ones who are responsible for monetary policy. Monetary policy affects just about everything. And so what happens is because that person is so powerful, um, people, investors all around the world pay very close attention to what the chairperson of the Federal Reserve Bank is saying, what they might be thinking. And um, they even will look for the nuances of a speech, what they didn't say, maybe what they implied, um, <laughs> things like that. Uh, so much to the point, uh, Chairperson Yellen said, just because we're not using the word patient doesn't mean we're going to be impatient. They have to splice words and speak very carefully. They call this Fed speak when they speak so carefully as to not to give any um, information a way that they don't want to give away or not to mislead the market because maybe somebody would interpret something one way when it's not really the intention of the chairperson or the Federal Reserve Bank at all. So they have to be very careful about how they, what they say and, and even how they speak. Now, one of the challenges for the Fed is the development of new financial products. There's new ways for people to deposit, make deposits. And, to, and then for those deposits to be used for lending and investments, these create new opportunities for the public, for banking customers, but, they're new, but these create significant challenges for regulators that have to oversee banks. And of course, you know, a lot of this is a result of the economic environment, but a lot of it comes from technology. Things like Bitcoin and Kickstarter and, and even PayPal, these are new um, ways for people to um, make payments and to hold money and to make investments. And uh, they're kind of outside the world of, of the, the, current, the current world of 
uh, of the Fed. So the Fed has to monitor them and maybe sometimes try to bring them into the auspices of the oversight of the Federal Reserve Bank. And certainly they don't want to necessarily be have that oversight. So there's a there's, there's a give and take to this. And so uh, there's a lot of innovation that happens in the financial sector. Um, it creates opportunities, but it also creates challenges, certainly uh, challenges for the Fed in terms of monitoring and um, uh, them over time. So if we look at um, the Fed's balance sheet, the Fed is a bank uh, in a sense, just like a Bank of America is, is a bank. And the largest asset on the Fed's balance sheet is United States government securities. So this, when, when the government needs to borrow money, they issue securities. These are tradable loans um, for, that the U.S. government issues with, you know, they have defined terms and rates and payments, and you can kind of trade them from one person to another. So they're, 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 they're highly liquid. And so um, the Federal Reserve Bank has a lot of these. Now, the what liabilities are on the Fed's balance sheet? Well, it's all the currency that's in circulation. They're the ones who issue the currency. And it's all the deposits by the member banks. So member banks, when they hold reserves, they hold them at the Federal Reserve Bank. And so the sum of all of the currency and depository deposits is the monetary base. This goes back to M1 and, and, and M2. When the Fed conducts monetary policy, they do it by conducting open market operations. This is an open market operation is the purchase or the sale of government securities. These loans that the, um, uh, uh, this money the government borrows that they, that they, they, they issue securities, they call government securities. Well, the Federal Reserve Bank to conduct monetary policy will either buy or sell these, and they will uh, uh, they'll buy or sell them either from or to the uh, commercial bank. So when the Fed buys these uh, government securities, these lo these securitized loans, it pays for them with newly created reserves held by the banks, and when the Fed sells securities. They are paid for with reserves from the bank. So an open market operation influences the bank's reserves. When a bank has more reserves, it can make more loans, and there's more money in the system. When the bank has less reserves, there's less loans, and there's less money in the system. So if the, if the bank wants to, if the Fed wants to expand economic activity, well, it buys securities from member banks. It pays for them with reserves. The banks have more reserves. They can make more loans. And there's more money in the system, which will have the effect of expanding economic activity. And it works the, you know, the, the, it works the opposite um, when they want to contract the economy. So here's an example of an open market purchase. Um, the Fed buys securities from the Bank of America. Um, and what happens is the amount of securities that used to be at the Bank of, uh, uh, Bank of America are now at the Fed and an equivalent amount of reserves are now at the Bank of America. So the Bank of America will have excess reserves it can use those excess reserves to increase the amount of loans it has. When there's more loans in the system, there's more money in the system. When there's more money in the system, there's more economic activity. So the open market operation, in this case, the, the open market purchase affects the amount of money through the reserve system. Now, if they wanna contract economic activity, well, they would conduct an open market sale because then they're selling the securities to the Bank of America. Their, their Bank of America pays for them with reserves that they have. The Bank of America has less reserves. They can make less loans. If they make less loans, there's less money in the system. If there's less money in the system, there's less economic activity. And so this is how monetary policy works. 
This is the, the, the open market operations. This is the instrument that they use to conduct um, monetary policy. Now, the Fed also determines the required reserve ratio, the percentage of money that they have to, banks have to hold in reserve. The higher the reserves, the less loans they can make. The lower reserves, um, the, the, the more loans they can make. Now, the, currently, the reserve requirement for banks is 10%. So if they receive $100 in deposit, they, can, they have to keep $10 in reserves at the Federal Reserve Bank, and they can loan out the other 90 the Federal Reserve rarely changes the reserve requirement. That's not the lever. It, it is a lever they could use, but not one they use often. And our system of banking is a fractional reserve banking system. So when banks make loans, they create new deposits. And these new deposits um, are, are new money. And so there's a multiplier effect to this. So when the when 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 a person deposits a thousand dollars at the bank, a hundred dollars will go into reserves, and nine hundred dollars be loaned out to a second person. This, this other person spends the nine hundred dollars, which gets eventually deposited somewhere in a bank. The person who receives it, and that bank keeps ninety dollars in reserves and loans out eight hundred and ten. This goes on and on the way you know, all these multipliers work until eventually um, the money works its way through the system. So the initial $1,000 creates more than uh, $1,000 worth of, worth of economic activity. But the quantity of deposit that the banks can create is, is limited. Um, it's limited by the amount of reserves they have to keep that the amount of reserves that they that they e either have to keep or sometimes they add additional reserves on a voluntary basis reduces the the amount of money that's in circulation and uh, it's also true that the public wants to hold some money in, in currency they don't deposit all the money that they receive when they when they sell something in banks they might deposit some and keep some so depending upon how much reserves the banks want to hold and how much currency the public wants to hold, well, that determines how much, how big the multiplier is, how much um, uh, um, uh, initial, uh, uh, you know, putting more money in the system, it determines how, how much m money it actually creates in the end. Because again, as we mentioned, the banks hold some deposits in reserves. Now, they're required to hold some deposits by the Federal Reserve Bank, but they might hold more. Maybe they feel that the market is too risky to make loans and so they'll keep more in reserves than they normally would maybe they're waiting you know for some economic activity to to, to change um and but the hot the more the banks want to hold in reserves the less is the increase um in the amount of money that's in the system and therefore economic activity it's also true that people want to hold some money as currency we call this currency drain there could be lots of reasons you may want to um, uh, uh, you know, buy hard, you, you may, instead of putting your money in the bank, invest in hard assets, um, things that you think will uh, uh, appreciate in value. You may want to hold money as, as cash for, for um, future buying, or there's lots of reasons why people want to hold, um, uh, hold cash. And so this is another thing that is a drain on the amount of money that's in the system and therefore the amount of, uh, of economic activity. And so um, if we start back at the Fed, you know, the money creation process begins with an increase in the monetary base. The Fed will conduct an open market operation. It buys securities from member banks. It pays for securities with newly created bank reserves. They, they take the securities from the member bank and they give them more reserves on, on, the, on the member bank's balance sheet. Now the bank has more reserves for the same amount of deposits, so they have excess reserves. They take those excess reserves and they loan them out to new borrowers. Some of those borrowers wind up either spending or depositing them, them at another bank somewhere. And so some of those new reserves wind up becoming new deposits at some other bank. And this, because of the multiplier and the fractional reserve banking system goes, goes on and on. And so in that process, 
um, new money is is created and, and is in the economic system. And so this gives you an idea of how the how this how the cycle works. Um, the Fed increases the monetary base by buying securities and increasing reserves at member banks. Excess reserves become loans. The quantity of money increases. Um, new deposits are used to make payments. Some of that money um, is, 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 is deposited. Some of this, some currency drain There's some excess reserves and some, and some, um, um, uh, sometimes there's some drain from reserves, but as this process goes around, um, the amount of money that's in the system after uh, the open market operations, after the Fed increases the monetary base, is greater than than beforehand. And that's the whole point, because by doing so, they're trying to have more money uh, in the system and more e uh, more economic activity. And we can say the money multiplier is the amount of money that gets um, um, added to the system for any, for a given amount of, of increase in the monetary base. So if we increase the monetary base by $100,000, and as it works its way through the system from one person to another person, from one bank to another bank, it winds up increasing um, the amount of money by $250,000, we say the multiplier is 2.5. And this multiplier how big the multiplier is depends upon the 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 um desired reserve ratios that the banks have and the currency drain the amount of money that the public takes out of the banking system as this process uh as this process goes on the smaller the smaller the amount of money that gets taken out through reserves and through and through the desire to hold currency the greater is the multiplier and so you know, how much currency do people want to hold? Well, it depends on if the prices are higher, they want to hold more money. If interest rates are higher, they want to hold less money. They'd rather have money in a bank where they can earn interest. The opportunity cost of holding money becomes high. Um, and when GDP is higher, everybody has more income. And so, um, um, you know, people want to hold more money because they're going to be buying and selling more things. Um, so the amount of money that people want to hold, currency they want to hold rather, uh, depends upon uh, you know, a number of factors. So when we look at the demand for money, it's like any demand curve. It's downward sloping. Uh, the higher the interest rate, the less is uh, uh, the, 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 the less is demand um, for money. The lower the interest rate, the lower the price or cost of money, then the more is the amount of money um, that is demanded. So there's a direct relationship between interest rates and the amount of money uh, that people demand. Interest rates being the, the price of money. And we can have a shift in the demand for money if something besides the price or interest rates um, changes. If there's an increase in real GDP, that will increase the demand for money. It'll shift rightward. A decrease in GDP will decrease the demand for money and it'll shift uh, leftwards, leftwards because when there's an increase in GDP, people's incomes are higher, they demand more of everything, including money, and the opposite is true when the GDP is lower. And so we have a money market equilibrium where the quantity of money demanded is equal to the quantity of money supplied, and that determines what the equilibrium interest rate is. Now, prices will adjust to make the quantity of real money supplied equal to the quantity of real money demanded. So uh, if they're out of balance, they're not in equilibrium, then prices uh, will increase or decrease in order to bring them into equilibrium, just like any other uh, any any other market. But there's, a, there's an optimal point, a balancing point, an equilibrium point between the supply and demand of money. And so what the Fed does is try to impact the economy um, through the supply and demand of money. I mean, they try to affect the supply of money and, 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 and using the fact that it will change prices in order to have uh, uh, either more or less demand for money. So if the Fed increases the quantity of money, there's more money in the system and the price level increases. 
So we move to a new long-term equilibrium in the money market, but nothing real has changed. Real GDP, employment, the quantity of real money, and the real interest rate are all unchanged because in the long run, the price level rises by the same amount as an increase in the quantity of money. So if we increase, um, if we increase the quantity of money, we increase prices, but nothing real has changed. Real GDP, the amount of employment, the quantity of real money, and real interest rates are unchanged. We have just a, a monetary phenomenon, but not a real phenomenon. And this is brings us to the quantity theory of money. The quantity theory of money says that in the long run, an increase in the quantity of money brings about an equal percentage increase in the price level. The quantity theory of money is based on the equation of exchange. It basically says that the amount of money, supply of money, quantity of money, times the velocity, how, many, how much money turns over is equal to the price level times the GDP. So if we were to reduce this equation, we would, we would see that the price level is a function of the money supply. That's what the quantity of money, that's what, that's what the quantity theory of money says, is that the price level is a function of the money supply. The more money we have in the system, the higher the prices we're gonna have. The less money we have in the system, the lower the prices we're gonna have. Let's take a, a closer look. So going back to that um, equation of exchange. So the velocity of circulation V is the average number of times in a year a dollar is used to purchase goods and services. Because when we buy something, the next person, when we buy something, the money goes to one person, that person buys it. So how many times the money changes hands during a given year is the velocity of circulation. How, how much is the money turning over um, as we, as we uh, 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 you know, purchase things? So the velocity of circulation is the total number of purchases, the price level times real GDP, divided by the quantity of money. If we rearrange things, we get the equation of exchange, which basically says the, um, uh, the quantity of money times the velocity is going to be equal to the price level times uh, the GDP. So the equation of exchange becomes the quantity theory of money. Now, the amount of money does not affect the velocity of money. That's pretty constant regardless of how much money is in the system or the GDP. So in the long run, a change in prices is proportional to the change in the quantity of money. So if we were to express the equation of exchange in terms of growth rates, the, the, the amount that money grows plus the rate of velocity change is equal to the inflation rate plus the real GDP change. And if we rearrange these, we see that the inflation rate equals the money growth plus the rate of velocity change minus the real GDP growth. Don't worry too much about that. What's important about the quantity theory of money is that in the long run, velocity doesn't change. It's fairly constant. So the inflation rate is equal to the money growth rate minus the real GDP growth. Said another way, we want the money growth rate to increase in proportion to the change in real GDP if we want inflation to be zero. So if the money, if the real GDP grows by 3% and the money supply, the money growth rate grows by 3%, we'll have no inflation because the money growth rate 3% minus the real growth, real GDP growth 3% is equal to zero. So if you, if you, grow the money supply in proportion to the growth in real GDP, then you won't have inflation. If you grow the money supply faster than the growth of real GDP, you'll have inflation. If you grow the money supply slower than the growth in real GDP, you'll have deflation. Now, this is the quantity theory of money. Milton Friedman, a famous uh, economist from, the, from the, the, the University of Chicago, and a famous monetary theorist said it this way, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon in the sense that it can only be produced by a more rapid increase in the quantity of money 
than an output. So the quantity theory of money says that we want to grow the money supply at the same rate that we're growing real GDP if we want to have zero inflation. If we grow the money supply faster than we grow real GDP, then we'll have inflation. And that is the quantity theory of money.